Hey, yo, what up? This your man, K Boogie, Mike Check Media. We definitely back in the building with the pioneers of hip-hop series. And we have a treat, a definitely special, special person on the line, somebody who I have emulated probably a thousand times as, as a kid, trying to anyway, and almost broke my foolish neck doing it. We got street dance, or none other than the man himself, Shabadoo. What's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing, doing excellent. Things couldn't be better. I'm, I'm excited about the times, and I'm excited about what I'm doing right now, and my future couldn't look brighter. Definitely. Well, definitely, you know, uh, on behalf of myself and Carolyn and Mike Check Media, we definitely like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk with us a bit. Sure, sure. No doubt. So, now... Let's go right into it, you know, just from the beginning, because we definitely, this is the Pioneer Series, so, you know, um, the early beginnings for yourself and with uh, with street dancing and how it evolved for you and how did you get involved? Uh, for, street dancing for me initially, I, you know, the, the term came sometime later, but the, but the actual fruit and the labors uh, of it, was happening earlier on in my life. I would say that I, I was a street dancer in Chicago. Uh, that's my native city. And um, I just grew up in a real eclectic household. I mean, being part Puerto Rican and part uh, Ethiopian, African-American, um, it it, um, it gave me a, a keen awareness of all kinds of music, you know, from Celia Cruz to... Aretha Franklin, from Tito Puente to James Brown, you know, so it gave me a, a quite a, quite a broad range of, of styles to pick and choose from. So I, I was a street dancer in Chicago, and my, me and my sister we used to actually dance together. And you know, Soul Train had its roots in Chicago. It was that's where it was started with Don Cornelius. So of course we went on the show and. Um, we didn't get much 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 television play, but we were happy just to be in the room. But anyway, uh, so we danced all around <laughs> Chicago. We danced all around Chicago. And uh, we made our way to California in the early 70s, I think like uh, circa 1971, I think the fall of 71, maybe the spring of 72, something like that. Wow. So you um, made your way out to... California, um, L.A. Now, is this when the group The Lockers formed, or had it already been formed uh, before that? No, no, no. Uh, the Lockers at that time didn't have a formal name. Of course, they okay. were locking. Yeah, Don Campbell, and they were doing what they were calling Campbell Locking, which is from Don, Don Campbell at Campbell. And a lot of the Soul Train gang members were doing it. So uh, after being in California for like, you know, just a short time, some three, six months. I eventually dropped out of school around that time, stopped, stopped going to school, um, and started working with my cousin, who was the, a staff sergeant at um, the uh, El Toro base. And he had side jobs. He would do, like, he had, he had a maintenance job, a maintenance business. And he would also, he also had a paper route business. So I used to uh, sit in the back of his car or whatever and, Chuck newspapers on people's lawns for extra money, and part of the maintenance was cleaning up drive-ins, and that's that's a messy job. I mean, drive-ins look cool, but if you ever seen one in the daytime, it's like it's like a garbage can the size of a football field. So I remember just being out there one day and just kind of picking garbage in the hot sun. And I look up to like I look up to God, and I just looked at God, and I said, "God, is this what I'm doing? I'm a garbage man." <laughs> and I kind of slumped down, you know, the, the post that the that the uh, that the speakers are held on that you put in your car. It was there, and I kind of like slumped down, and leaned on that thing, and just kind of like and cried. Yeah, I cried there that day. Uh, wow. I just thought, I'm I'm not going to be anybody. I'm going to be a garbage man. So. Uh, a short time later, my sister, 
she sneaks into my room and she says, Hey, there's a there's a um there's a dance going on at the BSU, that's the Black Student Union, at Fullerton College. And I was like, oh, okay. She was like, oh, we should get in because me and my sister are really good dance partners. So we could, we could win that thing. So we could win. We could win. And I'm like, how are we going to get there? She produces my mother's key. She steals my mother's uh, 64 Oldsmobile, the wow. keys to the car. So I, I, I didn't know how to drive. We drove there, which was like, Ten miles away, it took us like two hours because I was driving like five miles an hour. <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? I was like, anyway, we got there. We get to a, we get to the contest. Me and my sister make a long story short. We went second place, and a gentleman named Campbell Lock Jr. and another girl named Lynn Pickett, I think her name, Lynn Pickett. They uh they took first, doing that locking style, and I was like. But it wasn't like any kind of dancing that I had recognized. Um, you know, we were doing, you know, again, all the st- styles of dancing that we were doing in Chicago, but we weren't used to seeing that kind of stuff. It was, all of a sudden, this girl would come out and, like, spread her legs, and he would dive through her legs like 20 feet sliding on his chest and get up in a split and all this stuff. And I was like, what is that? You know, it, it wasn't like... It wasn't like the kind of dancing, soul dancing that we were doing in Chicago. It was very right. demonstrative. So anyway, after the contest, I said, well, you know, what's that dance you're doing? He said, hey, we call it locking. I said, what? So we call it locking. And I, I, I took back for a minute. It took me back a little bit. And I, I was like, you know, again, during that time, we were doing dances. We were named after animals, and he was doing dances. Named after, it's like, say, I'm doing the chair. How do you, how the hell you do the chair? <laughs> oh, like, they don't move. Chairs don't move. How do you do the lock? You want you to lock a lock, it doesn't move. You just, so I don't know how you imitate the lock. You understand? I didn't get it. I was just like, what is this? So, you know, again, the dances were out there. It was like the funky chicken, the Mr. Penguin, the penguin, the funky penguin. You could do the alligator. You could bend over and shake a tail feather. You could do the horse, you could do the pony, but how the hell do you do a lock? <laughs> it's like saying I do the refrigerator or I do the, I do the doorknob. <laughs> anyway, it was that kind of conversation, but that conversation led to, I said, hey, look, you, can you teach me how to do it? And he said, you can come over to my house, I can, I'll teach you, but you'd have to feed me. And that began wow. another a, a, it, kind of adventure because I thought it was a good deal at the time until I realized how much he ate. And then I knew <laughs> that I got I got shafted. You know, so yeah, his boy he he eat two megatons of food. Wow. Anyway, um I was like, man, I better hurry up and get this lock in quick before he breaks the bank. So anyway we start, I, I started living over there basically. I started living with him and it, the, the 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 senior Apartment holder was Scooby Doo, so Scooby Doo, Camelot Jr., and that Suki Lou, who eventually went on to marry my, marry my sister. Um, we all stayed in this one bedroom apartment over on 39th and Budlong in Los Angeles, and we were so poor we used to go and get rice aroni and cook rice aroni. And if we had a little extra money, we would we would scramble eggs and scramble eggs into the rice aroni. And we would we would say that it was Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> you made me try it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was like, you know, you know what? We would even eat it with chopsticks and things. It was crazy. Wow. Because we we because we, we would buy into the fantasy. Hey man, this is good Chinese food. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, and, and we you know being you know we're all ghetto and stuff. So we cut some bologna or salami in it too. So whatever. There you go. Ghetto fried yeah. rice. There it is. Yeah, wow. there it is. Rice and roll, eggs and salami. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, that that was the beginning of of our friendship and and my my going on the show. I learned how to lock in a, in a couple of weeks. Something I'd heard of, but I was doing it every day, all day long. So uh, you do the math, I guess. So I, I was able to get it right away, and um, I got a, a huge reputation. I got a name, 
they they started calling me Sir Lance of Luck, which is a, a kind of a crazy name. Like <laughs> uh, Campbell like, Junior, Campbell like, Junior. I was like, I mean, how many black people do you know named Sir Lance of Luck? That, okay, that's another radio show. We'll, we'll we'll talk about that another day. But, um, he he said to me, you know, I'm gonna call you Sir Lance a lot, and I thought, okay, that's good. And I, I asked him why why did he do that? He said, well, when I didn't wear my afro, my proud, you know, essence afro, my blowout kid afro. Then I would I would wet my hair and I would part it in the center and I would wear it down like a super fly. And I used to wear this headband. So when I wore the headband and when I parted my hair, one day he looked at me and said, Hey, you look like King Arthur or something. <laughs> so in my mind I thought I was doing super fly, but in his mind I was King Arthur. So there you go. That's a that's a that's a big division. Oh, wow. That's where he's so anyway, that. Yeah, yeah, he saw me as as, as, as Sir Lancelot and King, as, uh, King Arthur and the Round Table and blah blah blah. Anyway, later on, my name was changed to Shabadoo. I was dancing in a club called uh, the Summit on the Hill. It's a kind of an after hour joint. We would go to this first club called Maverick Flats, and we go to Maverick Flats and we drive up the hill to the Summit on the Hill. Over and over Oscar and Overland, I think I think that's what it was. And we used to, we used to dance there all night long. Well, during this time, you know, uh, DJs weren't popular, so uh, they would have bands playing, and then the DJs would come in and play to give the band a break, like have a drink, go to the restroom, whatever. And uh, the band that was playing that night was Bloodstone. If you're familiar with Bloodstone. And uh, wow. it's an old R and B group, and anyway, yeah, um, that's history there, Bloodstone. Yeah, yeah, wow. so, yeah. So Bloodstone, Bloodstone was playing in the club, and uh, they, and then they started riffing, shabba dabba doo bop, shabba dabba doo, shabba dabba doo bop. So afterwards, I was, I was riding in the green Volkswagen with Craig. I was like, hey man, I want to change my name. I want to change my name. He said to what? I said to shabba dabba doo bop. He was like, he goes, what? <laughs> Something like that. And he was like, it's it's too long. It's too long. He says, why don't you call yourself Chapu? Like that. So Chapu eventually was, was eventually changed and articulated as Shabadu. And, and there was a couple of different spellings of it and, and before I settled on this one, the, the more uh, noted one. Uh, it was spelled S H A. B A D U at one point, then it was S H A B A D O, then S H A B A D O O, then now it's Shaba S H A B D A hyphen capital D O O Shaba. So even that evolved. Anyway, that brings us up to speed. Ah, uh, to through, through the locker. So it was a, it was an interesting journey. A very magical time to end in my life. You know, I think back sometimes. I miss those guys. I really do. Yeah, and then it was uh, a, a, a lot of notables, a lot of notable people other than yourself that were part of that group. Uh, Tony Basil and uh, Fred Berry, Rerun. Yeah, yeah Rerun. Uh, you know, Rerun, I got an interesting story with Rerun. Uh, well, we call him Mr. Penguin. That's his name to us. <laughs> Rerun was the television character he played, but it, 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 when he was in the lockers, his name was Mr. Penguin. Wow! Because he he waddled like a penguin, and he had, he made up a little dance called the Penguin Walk, and you waddle. You, you would hold your hands on the side like yellow penguin wings, and you would waddle from side to side, if you can imagine. Anyway, man. Uh, so Mr. Penguin, I remember when I first started hanging around with the guys, and. I'm trying to build up. I'm I'm starting to build up my rep, and I just think, hey, let me go for the heavy set guy. You know, uh, he seems to be some easy picking. You know, there he is, he's overweight. You know, I mean, he can't sure he can't last long. He's not that flexible. And the one, I'm just gonna get you know get the little heavy set fat kid. <laughs> That's what I thought. 
<laughs> until I until I grabbed a hold of the alligator by the tail that I realized what I had done. And Penguin was an amazing dancer, much more than you can than you you saw on any of those shows or even in the lockers or any of that stuff in person. That boy could dance his butt off. Wow. And so here I am now. I, I now I'm tangling with him, <laughs> and I'm in the heat of the moment with this guy who's like basically taking me to school, right? And you know, after after a while, when when we, after the lockers were formally formed, every now and again he teased me about. It. He goes, "You know, I kicked your butt that night, right?" I go, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> even now, even now, like I knew him after breaking and stuff like that. He would, I would see him, and he go, "Hey, you know, I kicked your butt that night, right?" I say, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> he goes, "So, so before you get all, before you get all old zone and big and big shot with me, remember I kicked that butt that night." I go, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> so it was an inside joke between me and him. This is kind of funny. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, he's an incredible cool. relationship. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was it was a tenuous one. It was one. I, 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 don't get me wrong. We had, we certainly had our share of laughs, but by no means was it a was it a sweetheart walk. Um, the lockers, we didn't, you know, I had to break people's hearts, but we didn't really get along. Wow. Uh, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't. A, the love, peace, and soul thing didn't really work with us. We were, we were constantly fighting with one another and bickering. And 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 um, trying to outdo each other, it was just. I was the baby of the group. Okay, um, I was the youngest member. These all all these guys were kind of like my big brothers, but they, but, we, but we used to always fight all the time and argue all the time. So it kind of took a lot of the fun away because of that stuff. I know most people don't don't realize that, but we were able to put our differences aside when we performed. You know, you, you see these movies about the Temptations, right? Right. Yeah. And then definitely. you see, then you see like the story behind the Temptations. You see how like David Ruffin was a jerk or whatever, or yeah. you know, you know, and and how Otis was. You know, these different people arguing and fighting, and one guy was drinking too much. It, well, you know, at the lockers, we weren't, we weren't immune to that. We we were pretty much that way as well. Yeah. Also, we were acting like the temptation. <laughs> <laughs> Arguing and fighting and carrying on. But, but and, and, you know, and, and sometimes we wouldn't speak for weeks on end. We would still do the show, but we wouldn't speak to each other. Yeah. So you were able I, I mean, but that's just a testament to you guys and how, how good you were, I mean, to... I don't know. I don't know if I could have pulled it off. Well, I would talk to him. Well, the dancing, the dancing itself was the saving grace, our saving grace. It, it was the thing that really held us together in the end. It wasn't because we really liked each other personally. Um, it was the dance. The dance and the experience of working together held us together. But it wasn't because we liked each other because after we did the shows, we never really – hung out. Sometimes I would hang out with Penguin. Now, the ones that really hung out together that were close was the trio within the lockers. There was two groups. There was the lockers, and then within the lockers was another group called the trio. That trio exist, consisted of uh, Campbell Lock Jr., Fluky Luke, and myself. We were known as the trio. So all the routines, if you watch our routines, the routines were devised by the, by the trio and then talk to the other members because they weren't really uh, dancers they were capable of doing, or at, that, at least that time, capable of doing routines. Right. So we would make up the routines, teach it to them, and uh, if you look at how the choreography lays out, most most often you'll either say me. They called, and later I had another moniker that kind of laid on me. Uh, they would call me the mimic. The reason they called me the mimic is that I was I was capable of, of imitating other people's styles. So I could, if it was necessary, I could I could duplicate Greg. If I was necessary, I would, I would duplicate uh, Fluky or whomever. I could, I could 
you know, match them. They came, they, they came to call me the uh, the mimic. So uh, look at the routine. The streets switched up. You start to recognize that now when you when you see it. If there's anyone out there listening, go go look at our routine. You'll see you'll see just what I'm talking about. Everything's a setup. Well, the trio, we we set it up. Don Campbell would do a trick. We set it up. Mr. Penguin would do his thing. Set it up. Send the robot would do the robot. Set it up. Uh, wow. Tony Basil Tony Basil would come down stage and do her ballet brand of locking. And that was that was how it worked. Yeah, and definitely they like, get uh, a lot of those videos uh are on YouTube. Oh yeah, they are. Illegally yeah, but they're there. <laughs> <laughs> so they're there illegally, but they got a book. People got a book there. They got it. Yeah. They're like roaches, you can't get rid of them. <laughs> You know, I'm yeah. from Chicago, I told you. So we have a, I have a relationship with roaches. They're quite unique. <laughs> They're like family members. They so like anyway, family. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of them went to school with me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you took well, a with you. Yeah, yeah. He's like, hey, there's Billy. Hey, there's Billy Roach. Hey, how you doing? Hey, you got a with you, the roaches, the family. Like Sam, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, we were thinking of a uh, uh, flat with stranger when you walked in, didn't have a roach. It's like, hey, we get, we need to get out of here. This ain't decent. Yeah, yeah, man. So anyway, you were saying, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I was, <laughs> I was just gonna, you know, fast forward a little bit to uh, the movie Breaking, and how did you okay. get involved with that, and how did that come about? Well, it was again, it was, it was, it was uh, a. A stepping process. One, one. The first step was, um, I had created the uh, was the choreographer on the um, the Lionel Richie All Night Long video. Wow! Okay. And so I started. So I started. I choreographed that and put those dances together. And I was, you know, uh, the, the Boogaloo Shrimp, uh, Pop and Taco, Anna Sanchez. And a little Stevie, a bunch of dancers that were popular in Los Angeles, uh, started working with me during those days. And so the choreography for the Lionel Richie video uh, led to the um, to the uh, a documentary called Breaking and Entering. Now they they could have been either one. I think that Breaking and Entering came after the, the uh, Lionel Richie, or the Lionel Richie came right after the Breaking and Entering. Whichever case. I had a Shabadu crew, and they were part of my crew, and I created uh, a documentary idea, which I sold to Topper Carew at Rainbow Productions. Topper Carew was, was the executive producer on the Martin Show. Uh, not then, but he went on to become executive producer for Martin Lawrence's uh, television show and sold him on the idea to do a documentary on the uh, street dancing in Los Angeles. Uh, and I served as talent coordinator and the choreographer on that show, that show led to a Japanese commercial, so we went overseas to Japan and did a, a Bluebird commercial. Uh, and it was while we were on tour with Lionel Richie that I got a call uh, about a film, a rash of films we were making about the, the b-boying of breakdancing in, uh, in New York. Okay. So I, I was hired to star in this one film called Body Rock. Uh, it was for New New World Pictures. They had what they call a creative meeting. They took me off the picture and hired a guy. They said a guy that girls would like. So you know that was pretty hard to take. I said God, they need a guy that girls would like. Jeez. So they hired Lorenzo Lamas in that role. And so I went across town to meet with Menachem Golden and uh, to choreograph a film called Breaking. And I was meeting with them about choreographing a film. And and during the course of that meeting, they asked me, did I know how to act? I said, I'm from Chicago. Gave some stock answer like that. And they said, okay, shall we do from Chicago? Go overseas, Pamela, you know, basket and champion. And my agent set it up, the Southern Barnes and Minari. They were involved in it as well. And I auditioned for the role of uh, of Ozone. Um 
the, the character on paper was written, I think he was 18 or 19 years old, and at that point I was I was 20, 29 going on 30. So in the movie I was a 30-year-old playing an 18, 19-year-old, essentially. Man. Yeah. And now Book of Loose Shrimp ended up uh, becoming Turbo. Yeah, he, well, he did, yeah, and, and, and for good reason. Uh, one is, again, Shrimp and I had already been working together. He was part of my crew, and we developed a sort of a sort of rapport, a relationship that was very similar to to Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. So we used to we used to play this stick all the time. You know, he'd be the little funny guy, and I played the straight guy, and. Yeah. Um, and we would do that in our routines, and we would do that wherever, you know. We just, he'd be a little funny kid, 14, 13, 14 years old, and I was a straight older guy, right? So um, when we met, we brought that relationship to the table, and when they saw that, they hired us. They knew that they, knew that they had the Ozone, the leader of, of uh, TKO, and... Uh, they knew they had my sidekick, my my, my little buddy. Wow! And so there you go. That's his history. So that chemistry was was already yeah, you know, there. Like, oh yeah, we well, you know all that hey, cupcake, oh, yeah, oh. all that kind of stuff. We were already doing all that. And then yeah. like you, like you say, they try to they try to exploit it more in Breaking Two. If you look at the doll scene where I was showing Shrimp uh, Turbo how to get a girl, right. Uh, Okay, that, that was that, that was closer to our real personalities, like how we were. You could almost have said that Breaking and Breaking Two were documentaries, really. Yeah, and and that's what you know uh, what what gave it such mass appeal. I mean, and you know, and then to actually you know hear, I mean, and, and, and you know, it it looks to us as kids like well, mm-hmm. these guys have been friends all along, and it was actually true. So I mean, that chemistry was was real, truly genuine. And that's what's what's great about it. That's so true. You you're absolutely right. I, I, I think you're dead on with that one. For sure. Man, and 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 then the and then, like I said, the rest of history, man. You know, uh, yeah, the rest of going history. on to you going on to be choreographer for. Uh, a lot of stars, man. Who's you know? But, I, guess, well, I, I did I I did Madonna's World Tour. That was my my breakout one. And then I did uh, one one choreographed piece that I'm really proud of is a, a piece I did for it went to broad it just really went to Broadway. It was called Stand Up Tragedy. We did it as, in a lab process here through the Mark Taper Forum, and then it mm-hmm. and then we opened at the John Anson Ford. Went from the John Anson Ford to Mark Taper, Mark Taper, Connecticut, Connecticut, Broadway. Um, I served as choreographer on that, and uh, and won the Drama Critics Circle Award for Best Choreography. So it was a, a nice moment. Yeah, that's really yeah, I did a lot of this. Great Hello? achievements there, man. Great, definitely great achievements. I mean, uh, you know, now out of all the tours and everything that you did, uh, what would be your, I guess, uh, one of your favorites or defining moments, so to speak? Uh, you know, I know with the Broadway. Mm-hmm. A defining guess, moment, from, a defining, well, I had a few defining moments, if you think about it. My first defining moment was dancing on Soul Train. Second right. defining moment was, was becoming one of the original lockers. The third defining moment was getting my own television series. And starring on Broadway with Bette Midler. Um, I would say uh, another shiny moment was, was getting the lead in Breaking, in the two Breaking films. The, the, another one would be choreographing and starring in Madonna's world tour. And uh, and then going on and starring in Lombada and, uh, and, and, and those types of things. So I'm, I'm just one series after another. Now, there are... They were all defining moments. When you look back at them and you connect the dots, you realize they were all very special moments and that needed to happen in order to bridge me to the next one. Wow. And that's, that's you know, just a, you know, it just, you just kept going and going. Now, if um, presented uh, with an opportunity again, would you revisit the whole breaking 
movie series, if they, you know, because I know uh, you know Hollywood is in the process. You know, they're in the business of remaking a lot of movies, and we've seen a lot of stuff be remade. Or I, I, did, uh, I, I'm already breaking another breaking picture. Wow. I've written hey, a wait. screenplay. I've written a screenplay, and I'm, me and my uh, producing team is very excited about it. We're slating to shoot roll cameras sometime 2014. That is amazing. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm very excited. It's a, it's a great it's a great story. It's a great story for a new generation of, of street dancers. Um. I've taken my time on this one. It's a different kind of, of a motion picture. It's not it's not anything like those step up movies or anything like that. Okay. I don't want I don't want to take that approach. I don't want dancing on cars and dancing in coffee shops <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. That was, that's kind of nonsense. Yeah, so, it definitely does. I mean it's juvenile, you know, it's just what those films what those films have done is make a, a handful of people have an awful lot of money. Right. Because the dancers in those movies are not making an awful lot of money. But what they've done at, at the same time is have, have lowered the karma of the street dancer by turning us into these sort of cartoon characters. You know, like all of us, you know, we're walking down the street, three guys walking down the street or whatever, a group of young kids walking down the street. Hey, let's go in, the, in here and get us a... Uh, you know, an icy. You know, suddenly we're dancing on on the counters and everything all over Seven Eleven. You know, stuff. You, you know, you get arrested for it, and then I guess they're saying, "Well, they're so good that even police officers allow them to break the law." Yeah, right. So just the kind of nonsense stuff like that, and uh, and just and just what they hope for. If you listen to the dialogue, so what are you going to do today? Oh, I think I'll go down there. And- I'm going to battle somebody. You're going to battle them for what? <laughs> to be the winner. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're going to do, huh? <laughs> and then, here's another one. They said, well, we're going to have, they, they, they'll they set it up to be this sort of like underground. They said, well, it's going to be an underground battle in this movie. Right. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, a group of guys will all show up, all wearing red baseball caps, black jackets with gold buttons, and outfits that look like they cost like five or six hundred dollars a piece. Now, when's the last time you went to a club where you saw that just miraculously unfold like that? Never. I, I was like, you know what? I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and you know, and then and then what, what? Another pet peeve is when you see them, they're walking around in t-shirts, and all their t-shirts look like they just put them out of pulled them out of the package. You can almost see the the fold marks. <laughs> I mean, did they ever wear those before? Is any of this stuff in this movie real? Anything? Not even a T-shirt? Is even a T-shirt right. real? That's not, you know, that's not putting the dancers down because sometimes I've had this opinion and, and uh, I've made these points and some dancers say, well, you know, no, you're putting us down. No, I'm not putting you down. I say you have the right. talent. I say, I say that your talent is being misused and misrepresented. That's what I'm really saying. The talent is there, that's for sure, but it's being misused and misrepresented. Wow, and that's so, you know, and that was that was one of my 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 questions that I was going to ask you was how you kind of, you know felt about the movies and stuff that are around now, and, and you you it, just it, summed it, it all up. Okay, I'm going to put it out there like this, and you know, for the sake of sound like a Black Panther member, okay. But I tell you this, <laughs> you know, every street dancer and street dance that has been made, bar none, and I'm going to say this boldly, Hollywood, if you're listening, pay attention. Filmmakers, if you're out there listening, pay attention, get schooled. Every single street dance comes from the inner city ghettos, from black people and Spanish people. There it is. So when you go and you make a movie called Street Dance, but you don't have our people in the movie in those prominent roles, that's a slap in our face. No doubt. That's like saying, you know what, we're going to make a movie about the plantation, Right? So, they, they, so so black people can't even pick the cotton in the movie anymore. You got a bunch of white people keep picking cotton. We know that ain't happened. We know that it didn't happen like that. And then they run around picking cotton, riding on little motor scooters through the through the in and out of little <laughs> cotton rolls. Yeah, right? Really? That's how they did it. Right. right. Yeah, so you, you know, rather than show no, black people spend a lot of time in those fields breaking their backs, sweating and working their fingers to the bone 
and really show what it took to be a slave and be able to endure that kind of that kind of injustice. Slap them in their face and make a comedy out of it. They're just riding through white people dressed in head rags and wearing and wearing aprons. And, and riding on those little motor scooters in and out of the cornfields, picking cotton and, and putting them in hefty bags. Really? Like yeah. golf carts. How about yeah, you have them driving through with golf carts, getting the cotton off the thing? And, see, it's that, that kind of silliness, you know? So right. what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be, you know, white people or non-colored people, uh, non-people of color in, in, in these films. I'm saying there should be a level playing field, and it isn't. Hollywood has turned its back on the act, on the people that are the creators of these things. We, right. hell, for, for crying out loud, we created the term "step up." Exactly. Step up your game is created by by little ghetto kids. That's it. You know, we're gonna step up your game. You know, these are basketball terms, even. That's not that's not something you created, but then they take it up. They call it step up, and guess what? You get a white guy in the movie, you get a white girl in the movie. They go into the black neighborhood, they beat all the black people up. Take our women, beat us in our own dance, and ride off into the sunset, riding in a Hummer. <laughs> Good God! Unreal. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm being for real. And then you, then you. No, have, no, I'm saying that it's for, for them to put that out there like that, like it, you know, we yeah, we know that that's yeah. not right. Okay, I want you, I want you to people out there. If you're listening to this, go to your computers. I want you to Google a, a film called Street Dance Two and Street Dance that was shot in the UK. It has on the cover a a white guy with a with a with a with a crew cut holding a white girl in what looks like a dirty dancing pose, and the name of the movie is called Street Dance. <laughs> I'm like, wow. wow! How could you say I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a movie about the Cotton Club and not show any black people? None whatsoever. Like, that's, I, that's ridiculous. You 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 have a you have a, a, a you know a white guy and a white girl tap dancing and call the movie. You know, the Cotton Club. I don't think so. <laughs> Never go, nah. I mean, it just, nah. that's how it works. I mean, you know, when you know about Harlem's Renaissance period, you know, you know what the what the, what the the Cotton Club really was. It was a front for the mob and the people who performed on stage were black people. But if they made a movie right now called, called Cotton Club, it would be odd. Well, that's what they're doing now. Call these movies right. street dancers, step up. But but when you look at the cover, it used to be when you look at breaking, you look at you got me a mixed Puerto Rican black guy, you got a black kid and a white girl, and it was enough, enough ethnic throughout it. Like you had Asian and other kinds of of, of races cultures in the first breaking film. Then you go from that and you look at it, and you look at these two posters side by side. You go, oh my god! Not only can the can, can, we, we can't be the lead in the movie. We can't even be the bad guy in the movie, which is traditionally what they would eventually make us. Well, let's just make the black person the, the, the crook. He'd be the criminal, right? The criminal right. friend and the, and the sage voice to the, to the white lead. And then, and then uh, and, 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 and he'd be, he would be anchored to the neighborhood. But now, what they do now is the white guy's the lead. The black guy can't even be the friend of the lead anymore. The bad guy is another white guy, and the black guy is the friend of the bad guy, <laughs> which is now demoted us. We not we can't even be the crook in the movie now. Right. We can't even be the bad guy. So now we got to be the friend of the bad guy, <laughs> which is <laughs> like. I mean, hey, I, I, you know, I'm not making this stuff up. Go look for yourself. It's right there. Right there. No, no, no. Okay, yes, okay, okay, okay. They make a they make a they make a television show called America's Best Dance Crew, right? Right. So they couldn't find not one single person who was really from the streets, who really had the reputation, that could speak on camera, articulate, and was known for this particular thing. Nope, they had to run out and get Mario Lopez, didn't they? Boy, he 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 identifies. That guy tells us what the street is. And then, then we have a guy named Randy Jackson called it Randy Jackson's America's Best Dance Crew. Let me say something. Randy Jackson wouldn't know a real street dance crew if it hit him in the face. He walked up and slapped him in the face. Now, I don't care how many shows. He may, he may be rich and all that, but I'm telling you right now, he doesn't know anything about real street dance. 
I was telling that to his face. Man, and anyway, it looks <laughs> like he just putting the putting the money behind it, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. But you know what? But putting the money behind it doesn't make it right. Right. It's improper. Definitely. He should know. Definitely. He should know better. He should be ashamed of himself. Man, it's all about the Almighty Dollar now. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, you know, like, okay, well, I'm making another break, breaking film, and I'm wagering that people want to see something real again. So we'll see what's up. Yeah, definitely, no doubt. So now, um, outside of the, the new film, um, is this going to be title breaking or? What's going no, on it's not. It's not going to be. It, it's not going to be title breaking. The, the name of my new film is called Breaking Uprising. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right. So now, outside of that, um, do are you um, you have a, a school or, or you know where you're teaching you know street dance or what else? What else are you doing well, now? Uh, I, well, I, I'm, well, in addition to my writing duties and choreography or whatever I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm also a dance educator, so I make sure that I provide classes at affordable rates for kids. One okay. of the places I have is out here in Los Angeles at the Performing Arts Center in Van Nuys, California. I have an artist in residence tenure there. And uh, part of this this arrangement is I, I, I provide low-cost classes for kids and some of, some of their, their students are in the school. So I do that every Saturday from 12 to 3.30. So if you're in the neighborhood, come on through. Oh, yeah, definitely, no doubt, man. Uh, for the people that are definitely listening to that, you know, take heed and go learn from the best. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now, um, as far as the fans out there, where can they find you, uh, social media, or, you know, if they want to find out where you're at, uh, you have a website, uh, Facebook, Twitter? Yes, yes, I do. I, okay, my face, my, I'll, I'll start with my website. My website, you can find me at www. Shaba S H A B B A hyphen D O O dot com. My workshop page is www dot Shaba S H A B B A hyphen D O O dot com forward slash blog B L O G. And then you can catch me on my uh, my social networks is Shabadu. You know, it's designated Shabadu full, and then I have my Shabadu pages. If you just type in Shaba, I'm sure you'll find them. And then uh, you can catch me on Twitter. Twitter is uh, Shaba, S-H-A-B-B-A underscore capital D-O-O. So initial cap S, A, initial cap S, H-A-B-B-A underscore capital D-O-O. Shaba do on Twitter. No doubt. Uh, we uh, and, 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 and depending after, maybe after... 2014. No one comes and sees my new breaking film. You can catch me by a free with with a sign that says "We'll dance for food." <laughs> no, we'll, we'll no, break, no, we'll, no. We'll break dance for logic. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, I know that that film is going to do well, man. Uh, it's something that uh, the fans have been clamoring over. I know for the long the true fans. So I believe you'll yes. get great support on that, man. And that, and we wish you. Uh, much success on that venture, and definitely we'll have to reach out to you when that movie uh, get ready to come to screen, and we can definitely talk oh, about it. Oh, absolutely, 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 absolutely. I have a number of projects going on in Chicago, so uh, maybe later I'll tell you about those starting in September and November through the spring of of 2014, which we can talk about later, and maybe you can we can do some follow up stuff. So it would be great. Oh yeah, yeah. Definitely, no doubt, man. And uh, you know, on my half of because I'll, I'll be working with the Universal. I'll, I'll be working with the Universal Zulu Nation. On okay, projects. great. So, oh man, yeah, definitely. Uh, Zulu Nation, uh, big major part, and you know things going on. So that's going. And I know that I know that's going to be huge. Yeah, they're, they're a great bunch of guys, and they have a great directive, and they really care about young people. Uh, I'll be working. Uh, we we have plans to work with uh, Lord Cassius D. In Chicago mm-hmm. and King Shaka and and the House of Culture, uh, who's who's uh, the production house basically for Universal Zulu Nation out of Chicago. So we, we sure. plan some really nice stuff. We got some really nice stuff planned. So watch out, you guys. Hey, well, you heard it first 
from the man himself, the brother Salvador. Definitely, we give it up to you, man. I had talked to you, uh, stellar career, and uh, continually moving on. And we definitely going to revisit uh, soon, and definitely uh, want to have you back. Definitely, we appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Well, 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 thank you for having me. Thank you so much, and all you guys out there, do the best you can, do the absolute best you can, and and they're go- you're going to encounter people. They're going to tell you that you can't do something. And don't allow them to do that. And if you believe in it enough, you will endure. Believe and you will endure. Okay? Peace. That's it. Hey, words of wisdom from my man, Salvador. You heard it first. This is Mike Check Media, your man, Kate Boogie. We signing off. Peace. Microphone, check, 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 microphone